So this is a, this is a paper that's basically 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 extracted from from a from a from a book that I'm trying to finish on on Spinoza and the liberty of philosophizing. So okay. So when the Amsterdam municipality in 2008 decided to erect a monument for Spinoza, they chose to engrave onto the pedestal the quote they presumably believed would best capture Spinoza's lasting philosophical legacy and contribution to the history of Dutch political thought. It is a short phrase that can be found in chapter 20 of the TTP, according to which the end of the republic is really freedom. The philosopher was thus, by reference to the final chapter of his treatise, honored as someone who had primarily defended freedom and who saw freedom as the noblest aim of the social order. Some 17 chapters earlier in the same book, however, Spinoza makes an equally unambiguous but seemingly entirely different claim about the aim of the state, namely in chapter 3, when he proclaims that the end of the whole social order and of the state is to live securely and conveniently. So what was, in fact, the aim of the state for Spinoza? Was it freedom or security? I think one important first step towards answering this question involves realizing that the phrase engraved on the Spinoza monument was not conceived as a sort of standalone motto, but that it is taken out from a longer passage. Its meaning is governed by the immediate context in which it occurs. And what the preceding passage in chapter 20 describes is how the state's role with regard to its citizens is, and I quote, to enable their minds and bodies to perform their functions safely, to enable them to use their, freedom, their, to, to use their reason freely, and not to clash with one another in hatred, anger, or deception, or deal inequitably with one another. Hence it appears, if freedom and security are both the aim of the state, it is because the latter is an aspect of the former, or that security is just one component of a more complex conception of freedom, which also incorporates the use of reason, equity, and the absence of hatred, anger, and deception. Now, this complex conception of freedom, I think, also governs the meaning of the notion that Spinoza introduces first in the subtitle of the TTP, namely, the freedom of philosophizing, the libertas philosophandi. And realizing that is a key to do away with a current, but I think very misguided understanding of the freedom of philosophizing as something akin to an individual civil right, comparable to a right of, say, free speech, in the sense that it has in, an American legal, in the American legal tradition and political culture enshrined in the first and 14th amendments to the United States Constitution, a notion of freedom which has, in fact, nothing complex about it, but is simply freedom, freedom understood as the absence of obstacles to say whatever goes through your head. This was not, I think, what Spinoza meant. We should avoid confusing the freedom of philosophizing with another thing that Spinoza speaks of, which is a permission to say what we think. Now, this latter notion of a permission to say what we think, of course, also figures prominently in the TTP in the title of chapter 20, where he says, it is shown that in a free republic, everyone is permitted to think what he wishes and to say what he thinks. And many commentators have here simply assumed that this was just what Spinoza meant by freedom of philosophizing, namely a right, or a civil right more particularly, to speak freely. That's because that Spinoza recommends should be granted citizens by the political authorities in a, in a free republic as a legal permission that can be politically established in the same way as it can also, in an unfree republic, be suppressed, lacking or politically denied. I entirely disagree. In fact, contrary to these liberalist approaches, which see in Spinoza's freedom of philosophizing a principle of free speech, Spinoza's is not at all a theory about how to deregulate 
or abandoning the public sphere to its own devices. It is, quite on the contrary, a theory about how to regulate a public sphere so as to ensure that it operates the way that it should, namely, so that those who move within it behave with integrity, wisdom, and self-determination, or, as Spinoza calls it in the ethics, with freedom. <clears throat> okay, so let's get a more nuanced idea of what this freedom of philosophizing then is and how it is elaborated within the TTP. Now, what I think the TTP as a whole describes as free philosophizing is first of all what Spinoza calls a style or a way of speaking. This style is at the heart of a chapter of a TTP which is rarely the center of attention, but which is literally right in the middle of Spinoza's treatise, namely chapter 11. It is the only chapter which is exclusively dedicated to the interpretation of the New Testament. More precisely, it is dedicated to the interpretation of the letters of the apostles. It is often ignored by commentators, in whole or in part. But in TTP 11, Spinoza discusses two forms of preaching indicated by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 16. One which is, a, is speaking from revelation and the other is from knowledge. These forms of preaching constitute different ways of speaking or different styles. They are used for very different purposes. One is for transmitting revelation in the form of commands. The other is for teaching and giving advice in the form of arguments. The first style is attributed to the prophets, including to the apostles when they prophetize, which is in the Gospels. And the other style is specifically attributed to the apostles in their letters. And my principal interest here lies with the, what we can call the, the epistolary style the conceptualization which, of which I believe is of crucial importance for understanding the nature and form of free philosophizing. Now, in chapter 11, Spinoza argues, prophets do not always speak as prophets. They sometimes adopt another stance vis-a-vis -vis their interlocutors speaking, as he says, as private persons or teachers. And this is the kind of discursive mode that we encounter in the apostles' letters, as opposed to the gospels again. Hence, says Spinoza, the teachings of the apostles in the letters assume a style most unlike that of prophecy, an entirely different way of speaking. So let us see what the characteristics of this way of speaking is. Well, first, it is argumentative. It is based on reasoning. In their letters, the apostles, as he says, seem to debate, not to prophecy. The apostles are, these are all quotes, huh? the apostles are always reasoning. Paul proposes long deductions and arguments. And what the apostles taught simply without using any signs as witnesses, whether in writing or orally, they spoke or wrote from knowledge, that is, natural knowledge. And final quote, the more the prophets argue in due form, the more knowledge they have of the matters revealed, uh, approach, the more the knowledge they have of the matters revealed approaches natural knowledge. Okay, so it's all about argumentation and natural knowledge. Next, in the letters, the apostles speak with candor or sincerity. Hence, says Paul, says, says Spinoza, Paul speaks according to his own opinion, or as Paul himself put it in 1 Corinthians, he gives advice as a man who by God's grace is trustworthy, the apostles, like Paul, present their case candidly or even boldly, as Spinoza says, ex vero animo, to the natural judgment of others. Or as Paul writes to the Romans in a passage that Spinoza quotes, I have written a bit more boldly to you, brothers. Now those who will hear echoes of the Greek parisia in this, or the kind of bold free speech that Foucault used to study, may feel free to do so. And I think the comparison of instructive and completely warranted, but I leave that story for another time. I'll come back to it a little bit later. So third, on Spinoza's reading, the apostles seek to establish a sense of equality 
This point is suggested by, missing, by a telling misquotation that was first noted by Pierre-François Moreau and Jacqueline Lagré in their edition of the TTP. Well, by Ackermann, the notes are by uh, Moreau and Lagré. So Spinoza studies the New Testament mostly but not exclusively in the Latin version of Tremelius, translated from the Hebrew and Aramean rather than from the Greek. And as Spinoza's rendering in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, 6, Paul assures his recipients that, and I quote, he says this as one who is weak, not as a command, weak in firmus. But in fact, Tremelis' translation here has not in firmus, as someone who is weak in the singular nominative, but in firmis, in the plural dative. Paul does not speaking as one who is weak, but as to you who are weak, suggesting weakness on the part of Paul's interlocutors and not Paul himself. But on Spinoza's conveniently mistaken rendering, Paul puts himself on a par or even beneath those to whom he addresses himself, establishing a relation of equality between himself and his interlocutors. Finally, the epistolary style is not demonstrative or tied to certainty. The letters reflect the state of mind which is, as Spinoza says, undecided and perplexed. Popperians might like to say that the apostle's statements are not apodictic, but falsifiable. They present their opinion to the free judgment of the interlocutors, and I quote again, for whoever would confirm this authoritative judgments by reason thereby submits them to the discretionary judgment of anyone. This Paul seems to have done because he reasons, saying in 1 Corinthians, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. In sum, then, the teachings by the apostles in the letters are, on Spinoza's interpretations, reasoned, candid, egalitarians, and not egalitarian and not apodictic. So all these characteristics come with deep historical and textual connotations. Spinoza draws heavily on a long tradition from a quick antiquity related via humanism. To make a very long story short here, his conception of the epistolary style is essentially modeled upon the understanding from Greek and Roman antiquity of genuine counsel, char characterized by equality, frankness, and above all, friendship. Or as Spinoza writes, the letters, and I quote, contain nothing but brotherly advice mixed with a politeness which prophetic authority is completely opposed to. So this reference to Brother the Advice in this last passage is thus central to understanding long heritage from ancient philosophy and humanism that Spinoza draws upon, a heritage that goes from Cicero's on friendship to Erasmus's institutions of the Christian prince. But from a more internal perspective of the TTP, however, this same reference to Brother the Advice is also crucially important for understanding how Spinoza's chapter on the Apostles' letters fits into the broader argument of this treatise. For he also employs this expression of brotherly advice earlier in the book, in chapter 7, in a passage concerned with the interpretation of scripture and the teaching of religion. He writes, The nature of religion consists not so much in external actions as in simplicity and honesty of heart. This is not the domain of any public legislation or public authority. For simplicity and honesty of heart are not instilled in men by the command of laws or by public authority, and absolutely no one can be compelled by force or by laws to become blessed. For this, is what is, for, for this what is required is pious and brotherly advice, good education, and above all, one's own free judgment. Therefore, since each person has the supreme right to think freely even about religion, and it is inconceivable that anyone can abandon his claim to this right, each person will also have the supreme right and the supreme authority to judge freely concerning religion, and hence to explain it and interpret it for himself. So, when seen in light of this particular little passage here, it becomes clear then the importance of brotherly advice goes far beyond the mere stylistic status of the apostles' letters, but it has deep implication for the overarching conception of freedom of philosophizing. 
Indeed, through the intermediary of the Greco-Roman and humanist ideals with which Spinoza associated it, associated it, the description of the epistolary style of the apostles constitutes a kind of blueprint, a paradigm for how to engage in free philosophizing, and even a description of what defines freedom of philosophizing as a collective practice, namely that it is, as we've said, argumentative, candid, egalitarian, and non-apodictic. Now, when outlining the features of the epistolary style of the apostles, Spinoza not only outlined the definition of free philosophizing, but also, I think, the intellectual community to which the TTP as a book, indeed, or I think all his work, was destined, and indicated the relationship he wanted to establish with his own readership. Hence, at the end of the preface of the TTP, Spinoza addresses his audience directly, exactly in the way that Paul addressed the Romans speaking to them as wise men, leaving them to judge for themselves of what he says, but also excluding those who are not capable of engaging a conversation on the required terms. He writes, these philosophical reader are the things I here give you to examine. As for those who are not philosophers, I am not eager to commend this treatise for them. Indeed, I would prefer them to neglect this book entirely. So he's asking his readers to engage with the work as a piece of friendly advice for them to evaluate and nothing else. Now, within the kind of discursive space between interlocutors that we have seen established in free philosophers, so brotherly advice and so on, a particular kind of authority reigns. A conceptual of authority which is very peculiar and particular to Spinoza and which has been largely overlooked. The apostolic teaching in the letters comes with the, without the authority of command. They make no, as he says, authoritative judgments and decrees. The teaching does, however, not come without any authority at all. For, as he says, the apostles were granted not only the power to prophecy, but also the authority to teach. Or as Spinoza continues, the apostles received not only the power to preach the story of Christ's prophets, confirming it with signs, but also the authority to teach and advise in the way each one judged the best. Paul in particular, and I quote again, signifies the authority to advise whomever and whenever he wished, so he must be understood to speak of a freedom to advise which was his as a teacher and not as a prophet. Now, from what source does this peculiar authority to teach and advise draw its power and legitimacy? <laughs> now, the principal answer to this question lies in human nature, to which Spinoza attributes not only a natural power to judge, but also a natural power to express itself. And like all powers in Spinoza, it is not a power they can choose not to exercise. In fact, as he says, not even the wisest know how to keep quiet, not to mention ordinary people. This seemingly empirical statement of fact about people not being able to shut up enshrines a veritable metaphysical principle grounded in Spinoza's basic conception of the relation between body and the mind. Hence, if we turn to the ethics and to proposition, scholium to the proposition two in third part, while explaining how the mind and body cannot determine each other, Spinoza responds to a fictive adversary who gives as a counterexample that it is in the mind's power alone to speak and to be silent. Spinoza here deems the example counter to fact. Human affairs, he writes, of course would be conducted far more happily if it were equally in man's power to be silent and to speak. But experience teaches all too plainly that men have nothing less in their power than their tongue. Hence, it is in the nature of human beings not only to judge, but also to speak up. And it is this natural power which in Spinoza translates into a nat natural authority to teach and advise that all human beings possess in virtue of their nature. Free philosophizing is thus construed around an inalienable natural right to teach and advise of which all human beings as human beings will necessarily take possession insofar as they can. <laughs> 
not permitting people to take possession of that right is a kind of legal encroachment upon that inalienable right that Spinoza associates with what he calls a violent rule, which to the extent that it does not reduce citizens to mere beasts or deprived of their humanity, will necessarily encounter resistance, exactly because it amounts to an effort to take away from citizens something which it is, in fact, not in their power to hand over. The authority to teach and advise is therefore not reducible to a mere authorization by an external power, but it's something that emerges naturally from within each human being. And to philosophize freely consists exactly in the exercise of this natural authority. This is also why we must distinguish systematically and carefully between free and permitted discourse, uh, between on the one hand, um, uh, say, uh, free philosophizing as a natural authority and the permission to speak, uh, which is a, uh, something which is granted as a civil right. So let's look a little bit more at that. So in chapter 11, as we've seen, Spinoza constructs the freedom of philosopher in terms of a modus loquendi, as a form of exchange or a discursive space established between interlocutors who engage with each other in a particular way. And later in chapter 20 of the TTP, Spinoza, however, famously go on to show that in a free republic, everyone is permitted, uh, the term here is dissentia, or dissent, to think what he wishes and to say what he thinks. Now, by this notion of permission, Spinoza refers to something that is allowed by a decree, a legal right granted by an external authority, typically the public authority of the state. This is why, for example, as he writes about the Hebrews, that when they first left Egypt, they were no longer bound by the legislation of any other nation, so they were permitted, uh, as they wished, to enact new laws and to establish new legislation. Now, what Spinoza has to say about this kind of permission is that even in a free, st even in a free state, it must be restricted. He even cautions that it would be, in a free state, and I quote, disastrous to grant it completely. One should not be permitted to say whatever. Instead, such restrictions should be put in to make sure, and here we get back to the quote I had in the beginning, to make sure that people feel secure that they do not clash with one another in hatred, anger, or deception, or dealing equitably with each other, as we saw in the beginning. So, restrictions on free speech should be put in, which are not there to limit free philosophizing, but to secure free philosophizing. Restrictions must be put in on the permission exactly to make sure that all kinds of actions or speech actions we are or which make unfree, including prejudice, hate speech, deceptive speech, insincere speech, flattery, and self-interested speech, and so on, that all such kinds of speech which tends to disrupt free philosophizing are removed. And this is why Spinoza cautions, and I quote, anyone can think and judge and consequently also speak without infringing on their right, provided just that he only speaks or teaches and defends his view by reason alone, not with deception, anger, hatred, or an intention to introduce something into the Republic on the authority of his own decision. The provision here, of course, expresses all those restrictions on permitted speech which must be established for the sake of free philosophizing. So this distinction between a permission to think and speak, a legal permission or a civil right granted by public authority, and free philosophizing, which is grounded in an inalienable natural right which belongs to all individuals, cannot be emphasized strongly enough. Their confusion underlies all associations of Spinoza's conception of free philosophizing with US-style free speech. <laughs> 
And in order to avoid this confusion, it must be understood that the central chapter of the TTP, which explains what the freedom of philosophizing consists in, is not the chapter 20. It is chapter 11. This is where Spinoza establishes what free philosophizing consists in, namely the frank exchange of brotherly advice between equals in an argumentative style. Chapter 20, on the contrary, is just concerned with the limits of licensed or permitted speech or about how to legally establish such a framework for philosophizing, a framework for what kind of philosophizing should be permitted so as to ensure that it is free and that free philosophizing is advanced as much as possible. Okay, second part of the paper. Okay, so have, as we've seen, Spinoza does not envisage free philosophizing as an individual practice. He sees it more as something like a collective practice or a constituted public sphere. And this sphere has a certain internal constitution, rules that govern the way in which those who move within it should behave discursively. So that's all I described now, the brotherly advice and so on and so forth. But this sphere for Spinoza exists, exists, of course, for the purpose of private men so that they can exercise their own free philosophizing so they can realize their own personal freedom. But Spinoza, of course, also sees a public function for this, namely as a forum for public consultation, as an advisory structure constituted by the public to which he would grant a sovereign power for which he would want a sovereign power to turn for advice. Hence, free philosophizing becomes an integral part of Spinoza's democratic project because it represents what happens to the traditional function of political counsel in a free republic. The status of identity of counselors to the king, political advisors, of course, represented a major problem for the political theories of the 16th and the 17th century, from Erasmus to Machiavelli. In most of these theories, or Grotius for that matter, or Lipsius, go on. So in most of these theories, the authority of such counselors was seen as merely directive. Uh, there's no not authority, but just directing and people in the right direction. But it was also associated with a certain power which was grounded in the presumed knowledge or wisdom of the counselors. So rulers were considered wise, wise to employ wise counselors and reckless to try and do without them. The humanist ideal of a ruler was, was surrounded by a herd of privy counselors. Huh? It is what Thomas More was to, was to the Henry VIII, or Grotius to Alton Barnevelt. But such wise men were also expected to be declaring candidly and truthfully the consequences for a ruler of whatever action or judgment would was under consideration and not give self-interested advice. And this underlying presumption of candor, so here we're back to the paresia in Greek, this underlying presumption of candor was where the moral presuppositions of the humanist position tended to catch up with their argument. For the sincerity of political counselors was a condition of good advice, the fulfillment of which relied entirely on the reassurances given by the counselor. It explains why the rhetoric of paresia and the problem of intractable flattery in particular are such pervasive themes in the theoretical discourse about political advice in humanist political thought. Now Spinoza, like his contemporary Hobbes, were deeply suspicious of such moral presuppositions and very keen on finding ways to curb the exclusive authority that self-interested privy counselors, especially priests, yeah, exerted over sovereigns in courtly settings. And in order to do that, they were both seeking out solutions to this classic humanist pro problem regarding the general status of political counsel and political advisors, which would not rely on a mere moral presumption about wisdom and candor. Now Hobbes, for his part, achieved that by simply subordinating the advisory function to the sovereign will, 
so that the sovereign could freely dispense with whatever advice or advisers were displeasing him, while at the same time tying the authority of counsel to the sovereign whom he saw as the real author of all solicited counsel rather than the counselor. So in this way, Hobbes avoided making the authority that was tied to counsel a threat to indivisible sovereignty. In Spinoza's case, however, the same goal was achieved through not subordinating the advisory function to the sovereign will, but through a generalization of counsel to the general citizenship. As he saw it, the course of action recommended by Hobbes, so subjecting counselors entirely to the goodwill of the sovereign, was perhaps a guarantee against division of sovereignty, but also a standing invitation to flatterers and parasites. So instead, he found a way to associate the, rule, the role of the counselor to the sovereign power with an authority that belongs to all in virtue of their common human nature, namely exactly the authority to teach and advise. And this common authority is not predicated on wisdom or actual epistemic competence, but only on the ability to reason common to all men and what he calls the natural light common to all. In other words, by appealing to the natural authority to teach and advise, he laid down the groundwork for a system of political consultation between the sovereign power and the people where the latter, while in one capacity being subject to the sovereign power, would also, in another capacity, take up an independent advisory role with regard to it, standing, as it were, at the same time below and beside the sovereign. And this is the double role as both independent counselor and obedient subject that Spinoza gives to the idealized figure he describes as the best citizen in a central passage of the TTP, which I think summarizes his, his entire conception of the political function of a public sphere of free philosophizing. He writes, if someone shows that a law is contrary to sound reason and therefore thinks it ought to be repealed, if at the same time he submits his opinion to the judgment of the supreme power to whom alone it belongs to make and repeal laws, and in the meantime does nothing contrary to what that law prescribes, he truly deserves well of the republic as one of the he truly deserves well of the republic as one of its best citizens. But if he tries this to do this, if he tries, if he does this to accuse the magistrate of inequity and make him hateful to the common people, or if he wants to nullify the law seditiously against the will of the magistrate, he's just a troublemaker and a rebel. So Spinoza here puts his entire confidence in those best citizens who, while still obeying the law, candidly submit their opinion to the sovereign power, thus freely exercising their natural authority to advise the sovereign power in view of the public good. So on Spinoza's model then, no citizens hold a greater right than any other citizen to provide counsel to the sovereign power. All men, as men, hold this authority to advise as a matter of common natural right. And as Spinoza shows in, in the chapter 20, it is by not violating that right and permitting citizens to exercise this natural authority in public that a sovereign power can be assured to receive independent counsel rather than the self-interested flattery a courtly system of privy counselors would afford him. And this is the reason why, as he says, if good faith not flattering lip services to be valued if the supreme powers are to retain their sovereignty as fully as possible, freedom of judgment must be granted. By contrast, a violent ruler who does attempt to violate that natural right will inevitably face what he calls resistance from the best citizens. He writes, the more the authorities try to take away this freedom of speech, the more stubbornly men will resist. Not the greedy, of course, or the flatterers, or the rest of the weak-minded, those whose supreme well-being consists in contemplating the money in their coffers and having bloated bellies. Resistance will instead come from those, who, uh, from those whom a good education 
integrity of character, and virtue have made more free. Now, I think it's very important that we do not confound such resistance with rebellion. It does not consist in civil disobedience or a refusal to act in accordance with the law, laws put down by the sovereign. It consists in submitting a disapproving opinion in public in spite of a ban on doing so. It is a limit form of public consultation, namely public consultation against the will of the sovereign power. This does not amount to disobeying a law in any proper sense, for it does not in reality fall under the public authority of the sovereign power to emit, to emit any such ban. The authority to give advice to whomever he wishes belongs to every citizen as a matter of inalienable natural right. And the attempt to take away the freedom to speak one's mind therefore cannot be um, cannot be a law in any proper sense. Making a ban against speaking up um, represents only a violent attempt to encroach upon a natural light. right. Consequently, resisting such an attempt by not respecting a putative ban does not amount to disobeying a law. The notion of resistance thus enshrines the relative independence of the public sphere of free philosophizing from the sovereign power in terms of legal authority. In resisting, citizens assert their natural right to speak their minds against a ruler attempting to deny them that which, can only, which cannot be done by law but only by violence. Now, this model of public consultation, which defines a free republic for Spinoza, does not necessarily require democracy. In the, in the TP, at least, Spinoza believed that peace and some measure of freedom could be achieved in any form of state, including a monarchy. This could be achieved if only the sovereign power would be most attentive to the well-being of the multitude, end of quote, and willing to listen to his subjects and act for their advantage. That is, as he writes, to be led by a nobility of spirit to consult the public advantage. Kings would do well to have a large council constituted of citizens. But we should in particular here dwell a little on the curious position that such councillors occupy in Spinoza's free monarchy, because it would help us establish distinctions that would explain more precisely why exactly Spinoza favours the democratic model in the end. This role of councillors is in fact double. A monarchy, argues, requires a large council of citizens because, he writes, human wits are too sluggish to penetrate everything right away, but by asking advice, listening, and arguing, they are sharpened. So the primary role of the council would be, as he says, to give advice about things to be done so that the king may know what he must decree for the public good. But this same council, however, should also assume another function, namely, as he says, to look after the whole administration of the state as deputies of the king. This is necessary because the power of one man is quite unequal to the task of preserving a whole state. So for that reason as well, a king absolutely requires counselors. So two functions for the counselors in a monarchy as advisors and as deputies. Now, it is of some importance not to confound these two functions, even though they are held by the same people. When acting as advisors to the king, the councillors stand beside him, so to speak, exercising their natural but private authority to teach and advise. When acting as deputies to the king, on the contrary, these same members of the council execute the public authority of the king acting on his behalf. In the first case, the council exercises authority over the king. In the second, the king exercises authority over the council. Hence, as an advisory institution, the council does not emit statutes and decrees, but recommends to the king that he does. As an executive institution, the council does not emit statutes or decrees either, but enforces those made by the king. And this arrangement would work in a monarchy, Spinoza thinks. If only a king would follow these recommenders for, for what he calls a well-ordered monarchy, it would yield great security to the king in his role and to the citizens in maintaining freedom and peace. <laughs> 
Still, a democratic form facilitates a well-ordered relationship between the public sphere and the state, because the same set of individuals figures on both sides of the equation, all bite in different capacities, potentially or actually, namely, as private citizens providing public advice to the sovereign power on the one hand, or as public agents vested with sovereign power themselves. Hence in the TP, this is chapter two, Spinoza defines the three state forms by the number of members of the governing council that has responsi responsibility for public affairs. That is, the public authority to govern. But this definition is approximate at best because political councils always assume two functions, an advisory and a governing function, and these two functions must be kept separate. As we've already seen in the case of monarchy, a council has no public authority on its own, but only a private authority to advise. It can, however, also assume public authority depending on whether its members are also in a second and distinct public capacity vested with sovereign power or whether they act as mere deputies. And this is what makes the difference between a well-ordered monarchy and a democracy. In a monarchy, councillors can only acquire public authority, can acquire public authority only in a capacity as deputies to a single sovereign, the king. Therefore, the advisory and governing structures of the state will never align, as it were, but also always remain in a state of deep dissymmetry. A democracy, by contrast, is a state where the members of a comprehensive citizen council are also eligible to assume sovereignty themselves. All those who potentially or actually have the private to authority to advise also potentially or actually have the public authority to govern. This alignment of capacities is comprised in the very definition of democracy. A state thus constituted so that, as he says, no one so transfers his natural right to another that in the future there is no consultation with him. And where for this reason, the responsibility for public affairs is the business of a council made up of the common multitude. It is also this symmetry of the advisory and executive structures which makes the democracy the most absolute state form for Spinoza. So, there's not that much left. In any case, Spinoza believed that in a free republic of whatever, of whatever forms, citizens should live not just as subjects under a sovereign power, but take up a place next to the sovereign power as a source of independent advice. Spinoza thus set up an, an ideal of citizens who, through free philosophizing, would raise themselves up to the point where they could fund confidently contribute to, the public, to public political deliberation. Spinoza, of course, did not stand alone with such ideals of active citizenry. It was very common in the Dutch Republican tradition. In their political writings, the brothers de la Cour, for example, mounted a frontal attack on any courtly system of political and ecclesiastical advisors to the sovereign powers by proposing the establishment of direct channels between government and citizens, enlisting the whole emergent class of both well-educated and financially independent citizens to contribute actively to the constitution of, free, of true republicanism. More precisely, this emerging class belonged to those whom Caspar Baleus named wise merchants in his famous 1632 inauguration lecture at the illustrious school of Amsterdam, the Mercator Sapiens. Indeed, many of the virtues that Spinoza associates with free philosophizing, practical rationality, honesty, equality, candor, converge with those Baleus identified in the wise merchant who, as he says, Baleus now, with a sincere and good mind, distinguishes decent from vicious merchandise like he distinguishes virtues from vices. Hence, like his fellow Dutch Republicans, Spinoza saw the merchant class from which he himself came and from which many of his closest friends were members as a potential source of constant political advice to the magistrate as a class of citizens emerging outside the courtly structures of political council otherwise available to the magistrate. And just like the brothers de la Cour, he saw this as the most effective, effective means to curb the influence of what he called flatterers, that is, such in self-interested parasites who in the entourage of a sovereign would use their influence for personal gain rather than the public good. 
So transforming the system of political advising from one of privy councillors to one of public consultation with the full body of citizens would necessarily alleviate the problem of political deception and sedition because the self-interest of private citizens taken collectively would start to necessarily converge with what the Coup de la Cour brothers and Spinoza all called the true interest of the state, which for Spinoza was nothing but the self-interest of the sovereign power. So Spinoza's conception of free philosophizing was in part shaped by the experience of the De Witt's true freedom in the 50s and 60s, of course. Still, it is important to realize in Spinoza's historical circumstances, the idea of broad public consultation was something which was most often associated with the orangist side of the political equation, in opposition to what was considered the elitist domination by the regions. In this respect, Spinoza's conception of free philosophizing is, is sufficiently popular in scope to represent a rebuke of the undemocratic republicanism embraced by the David and the, David and the Regents Party. We should not, however, move too quickly and then declare Spinoza to be characterized as anything, anything like a populist, uh, seeking to su simply circumvent the elites or recommending that the sovereign powers would do best to cater simply for the desires of the people, no matter how inconstant or irrational. If Spinoza considered it to be in the self-interest of the sovereign to consult directly with citizens, he also saw it as a necessary precondition for this that the citizens should first be worthwhile consulting, which required that they should be free in the strong sense. That means in possession of their own judgment and not subjected to prejudices. The citizen's actual ability to philosophize freely is the condition sine qua non under which it is beneficial to grant them permission to speak their mind. For example, when the Hebrews were liberated from bondage, they were ignorant and uneducated to such a degree that they would not know what to do with such a permission to think and to say what they think. They would only use such a permission to subject themselves even further to prejudice and superstition, becoming even more unfree than they were in the first place. For Spinoza, the adoration of the golden calf huh, in Exodus is the case in point here. It showed how ignorant they were, and understandably so, for as he says, certainly it is not credible that uneducated men, accustomed to the superstitions of the Egyptians and worn out by the most wretched bondage, would have understood anything sensible about God. In fact, their interest was best served by establishing such conditions as would prevent them from acting upon their ignorant inclinations, only bogging them further down into bondage. And this was why the theocracy established by Moses was such, was such a highly regulated state where practically everything what could be thought, said, and done was regulated by law. It is important to realize that, how, however, that this strict theocratic regime did not restrict the freedom of philosophizing because there was no such freedom yet. That is, there was simple, no, simply no people with sufficient wisdom and integrity to make it flourish. Moses did not stifle free philosophizing, for all the thoughts the Hebrews had to express were those associated with their own submission. In fact, the extensive legislative framework established by Moses was designed to put restrictions not on free philosophizing, but exactly, exactly on that by which, reason of which there was not yet freedom of philosophizing, namely ignorance and prejudice, superstition, and inherent submission. Hence, Spinoza did not recommend that citizens should be permitted to express whatever prejudices at every, which at every, any given moment would stir up their passions, even lest that the sovereign power should govern so as to accommodate those prejudices. He had no intention of transferring political power to those he called weak-minded, ignorant of themselves. Instead, he was addressing himself to those people who are men distinguished for their integrity, famous for their virtue, and on that account, envied by the mob. And what he aimed at in the long term was the creation of an informed, independent citizenship of wise merchants in possession of their own free judgment. <clears throat> 
Do you want me to finish it? There's a couple of pages more. I can stop here. Depends on you. I guess uh, we're. Yeah, finish? Wrap it up. Okay. So, on Spinoza's conception, the freedom of philosophizing is necessarily a collective exercise. And the freedom involved less that of the philosophizing interlocutors than that of the philosophizing itself, as it occurs between people who are liberated from prejudice and have taken such possession of their own judgment that, as he says, rather than just repeat something they've heard, like a parrot or automaton, speak, speaking with their own minds. For Spinoza, the Apostle Letters provides a paradigmatic example of how to go about doing that, because as Spinoza reads them, they engage in a collective style of thinking and speaking, with the address, uh, which, um, when addressing to each other, uh, by giving sincere brotherly advice to each other based on their sole authority to advise and to teach. And this special type of authority belongs to all human beings as an inalienable natural right. And the freedom associated with it, the freedom of philosophizing, is not something that can be attributed to individuals, strictly speaking, but it's a set of a certain kind of discursive relations that exists between individuals, a modus loquendi, a way of speaking. So this means that freedom of philosophizing cannot be practiced alone. It occurs only in a shared space of debate. And depending on the kind of civil society such as space, uh, on the kind of civil society one is, such a space can take different forms. At one extreme, it can take the restricted form of a circle of philosophically, philosophically minded interlocutors. Now commentators from Leo Strauss onward have, who have seized on remarks in Spinoza which suggest a political strategy of secrecy and prudence. Like, for example, in the preface, when Spinoza addresses himself only to the philosophical reader, or to those who would philosophize more freely while encouraging the common people to neglect his book. Well, they have hit upon this form that free philosophizing must necessarily take in the least free republic. That is, in a republic governed by violent rulers under the sway of priestly flatterers propped up by the mob. At the other extreme, in a free republic, the space of free philosophizing can take the form of a, the unrestricted form of a general public sphere of independent and well-educated best citizens or wise merchants who engage in public life and provide valuable political counsel to the, to the sovereign powers. And of course, the society in which Spinoza actually lived was situated somewhere in between these two extremes. As Arthur Weshtein has pointed out, any characterization of the public debates in the in Dutch Republic during the Golden Age as a, an alleged neutral space, open and respectful of all, is certainly overly idealistic. The Dutch debating culture was lively but not particularly polite, oriented towards rational argument. Freya Sierhus's study of pamphleteering and libel and satire during the Arminian controversies in the early century is very instructive in that regard. And what Raymond Jode has written about the English public sphere in the 1640s also applies to the Dutch theolo theological political debates during the later decades of true freedom, namely that they were, as Jode says, characterized by religious and political faction and conflict, a discourse that was rhetorically manipulative rather than ideal typically rational. Hardly dedicated to the provision of sincere brotherly advice alone, it was riddled with satire, slander, propaganda, libel, flattery, vulgarity, insincerity, dissimulation, misappropriation, and misattribution. Many means to gain the public opinion were deployed that could hardly count as open debate, candid advice, or indeed free philosophizing. It still remains the case, however, that some new kind of public sphere even if it's rather less than rational and not exactly free, did emerge in the Netherlands at that time. As Hent Nirop shows, rudimentary structures of public council consultation and petition emerged. Citizens frequently turned to the public authorities to vent private grievances and solve disputes. What was missing, however, were clear guidelines for how and when to address questions of public import and how to distinguish them from those of merely private interest. As Nirob says, the private and public spheres were not rigidly separated but constantly spilled into one another. 
Within that historical situation, normative theories of how to better frame public discourse then also emerge in response to this new situation. And the TTP is one such response, I think. Spinoza's conception of free philosophizing forms a normative theory attempting to conceptualize how, ideally, one could harness the unwieldy powers of free public discourse. The deeper political aim of Spinoza's defense of free philosophizing is the creation of a sphere of discursive action in relation to the state, spanning in intensity from peaceful public consultation between good citizens and a noble sovereign to non-rebellious resistance to violent rule. Spinoza's conception of the freedom of philosophizing, and especially his description of how the best citizens resist violent rule by speaking their minds but without engaging in rebellion, bears a striking resemblance to Kant's labor, later conception, conception of the public use of reason in his famous 1784 essay on enlightenment, with this injunction to argue as much as you please, but obey. Moreover, Spinoza's free philosophizing includes an essential aspect of paresia, of candid and bold speech, encapsulated in the Paulinian declaration to write more boldly to the Romans, which resonates across the century with the Kantian resumption of the Enlightenment motto, sabre auda. Finally, Spinoza shares with Kant a great confidence in the ability of collective reason to structure the public sphere by the force of its own devices, if provided the institutional and political framework to do so. Spinoza's vision of the freedom of philosophizing is a strikingly optimistic one, and a strikingly rationalistic one too, deeply committed to the idea that rationality and freedom are inextricably intertwined within the intersubjective structures of public debate, and that both would necessarily come to expression, mutually pulling each other forward if the institutional and political conditions for this are fulfilled. What Spinoza calls the natural light common to all is everywhere present among men, if not actually, then at least as a common potential for self-liberation they share in virtue of their very humanity. He would entirely agree with Kant's assessment that, and I quote Kant, it is difficult for any single individual to extricate himself from the minority that has become almost nature to him, but that a public should enlighten itself is more possible. Indeed, this is almost inevitable, if only it is left in freedom. This shared confidence in the potential of rationalization inherent in the public use of reason constitutes, I think, a deep and significant commonality between Spinoza and Kant, which anachronism be damned, it would not be inappropriate to describe as a common project of modern enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, Moines. Mike? Thank you, Moines, for that... Uh that uh, bracing thing. I'm, I'm quite, uh, I mean, you, thank you for uh, uh, ex describing uh, Twitter in, uh, in the old, in, the old uh, in, in its precursors context of realm of rational, uh, rationalization, which is used simply to manipulate and, and curry public favor in a, in a particular uh, re uh, direction. I think we're, we're in a, like to bring it up to date, I think we're in a a kind of a crisis now of best citizens or whoever can, I mean, now it, nowadays I guess it's, you can nominate yourself as a best citizen and uh, 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 perform on uh, and uh, discuss with, with varying degrees of sincerity uh, how things should be in the public sphere. Unfortunately, uh, well, we have in nominally uh, democracies which act only in the interest of merchants um, that uh, and in that case, they and, uh, they only act in uh, in the in in the function of negotiating the uh, conditions under which labor is provided for uh, production. Uh, they do not uh, uh, serve a broader purpose of the emancipation of of everybody in order for you know the the, the realm of of best citizenry to to be expanded. And uh, for everybody, of course, the purpose of becoming a best citizen is for us to uh, uh, enjoy or to 
move towards um, uh, appreciating God or, or enjoying uh, being close to God together, right? <laughs> it, 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 I, I'm, I'm having, uh, but I'm wondering if you could help us uh, bring, bring it up to date uh, and see the, the challenges that, were, uh, um, that you were describing at that time. Uh, how, can, how can we confront, like how can we uh, use this, this figure of the best citizen today to, uh, to help us in our contemporary political struggles in order to um, improve the conditions of the, the majority. The, one of the, one of the uh, if, as a side, I mean, at that time, you know, it was enough to say that you were doing it in the national interest, right? That the prosperity of the nation, like, okay, we're all best citizens, but we're all really interested in the national prosperity, and that will raise up everybody in general. But today, you, you, you cannot, we don't, we don't have that allegiance. The, 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 Peop, the the um, political actors behind best citizens or like best citizens are in the employ of political actors who have no national allegiance. They are uh, allied to international finance, and in that case, that, that this disrupts the the whole <laughs> the whole prospects of of uh, local uh, improvement. Yeah. So. A couple of, of things about that. So, uh, uh, one thing we want to avoid doing if we want to bring it up to date, as you yeah. say, yeah. is to try to say um, distort who Spinoza was in order to make him fit our requirements. Uh, and I think there's stuff that are needed today that Spinoza is not capable of giving responses to. And one of the things is that he doesn't have anything or much to say about the working class here. Uh, the kind of public sphere that he is advocating um, is, I mean, so, so this of course, I don't know whether any of you know Jürgen Habermas' work on the structural transformation of the public sphere, which of course this is very closely related to in many ways. And one of the things that Habermas showed was that in the 18th century how public spheres, uh, a public sphere, showed up at the same time you had the emergence of the nation state and the separation of the state of society, huh? so, which is also Hannah Arendt. Huh? Hannah Arendt, the basic condition of having a nation state is the, you know, the separation of state and society. And that's the kind of thing that Habermas also uh, saw emerging in the 18th century by studying the British, the German, and the French culture, but he completely overlooked the Dutch. He has nothing to say about the Dutch. And if you look into the 17th century of Dutch culture, you will actually find that there's a, actually happens something that, that an emergence of a public sphere of this kind actually already happens a century before, or half a century before here. So, so there's a historical point about, uh, that, that I was trying to make here about that. Uh, which speaks to, you said, at the time of being. So we have to be very careful about what time and where and how and so on. There's, there's some historical precision required here. Um, the other thing is, is, so, so is, is, is then about um, this emergence of a bourgeois public sphere that we can already see happen in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. If you go on with the analysis that Habermas has made of the, of the you can see that this, within the centuries that comes up, this starts to break down. And this is not the kind of public sphere that we have today. So the, the, uh, uh, and because it involved, uh, it, it's been Spinoza's conception uh, uh, of who is the best citizen is modeled on this market of sapiens, which, uh, you know, uh, 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 that there's, there's something of the confidence in the, in the, say, in the humanist confidence in the candor of the good political counselor the presumption of candor and sincerity in a good political culture, which is, as it were, transferred by Spinoza into the Mercator sapiens. Uh, uh, the, wise, the, the wise merchant will also be uh, sincere and candor, have, have candor in the same way, which is, we might say today, contrary to fact. Uh, uh, so that's not how it works. So, so what we can, I think, we can learn about this is that um, I think the way that he formulates the, 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 the alignment between the advisory and the executive structures within a political uh, 
uh, within a political uh, uh, regime, how he thinks about that citizens should relate to their state in several ways at the same time, both as subjects and as advisors to them, and how you can set that up uh, democratically in an aligned kind of way. Uh, we have something not necessarily to learn from it, but it's, it's, it, it gives us a good idea of where our, how, let's say, our own ideals about the liberty of democracy at least came from. Uh, and also, I think I'm, I'm, I at least agree with that. Uh, it's just a question of how many citizens should be involved in this, and of course, it should be much broader than what, what Spinoza represents. Uh, I think. So, um, yeah, so I, I, thanks a lot for the paper. I, I, there's a lot that interested me in it, and I have a question for you. But before I ask my question, um, I want to sort of take issue with how you framed your question. Okay. Because I th I'm, I'm very puzzled by this um, attitude that somehow our governments are only interested in international finance or something like that. I mean, here we are all sitting here, funded by um, this wonderful organization, which is itself funded by government grants. We all work for universities that are largely funded by public funding, which pay us salaries to study Spinoza and to study truth and to do the work we do, uh, largely uninterfered with by those other kinds of interests. Um, it's not to deny that there are powerful financial interests in the world, but I find that attitude very puzzling and very strange. Um, and I, I, don't, I want to sort of state that I don't agree with it <laughs> and that you don't speak for all of us when you, when you make those kind of remarks. Um, <laughs> no. Um, but sometimes it's, these things are sort of seem to be being put out as if, of course, we all feel that way. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think what you've said is true, actually. I just think it's false. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, 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 want, I want to be clear this, about that. This space of argument is the anomaly. We see that philosoph philosophy uh, departments and the humanities in general are being defunded across Europe. So uh, I'd just like to point that out. Uh, as a yeah, I, I could also say, Beth, uh, I disagree that uh, my university yeah. is not, it was publicly funded, I guess, a quarter century ago, um, but today, um, I did see the, I, I don't want to say a figure because I don't want to get it wrong, but it, it's, it's um, the government doesn't even fund 50% anymore, but I don't know how low it's gone, but it's going lower all the time. So I just, I think there's probably, there's variability here. Yeah, but I, I my, was my, my, my salary is not paid by the government. It's paid by international fees and student fees and so on, which are very, very high. You, you, it, universities are nevertheless pay. supported by no, you said states You everybody to... here, and I'm just saying <laughs> my, Sydney University is not funded by the Australian government. It's not. Well, I'm going to move on to my question now for moments, which is, which is not about this. Um, <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you was, um, or what, rather the comment that I wanted to make, um, was to connect what you were saying about the TTP, which I found fascinating, with something that Spinoza says uh, in the ethics um, about the passion of ambition. So I was, and that, you, I think you didn't mention ambition, but it struck me that ambition is precisely the, um, the passion that, 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 cuts away at, at this whole sort of culture of advice, right? Because the way Spinoza defines ambition is perhaps peculiar from our point of view today. It's maybe a very Machiavellian um, sort of notion of ambition, but he defines ambition as um, wanting others to live as I live, right? So in other words, ambition means I give other people advice and I want them to live by my advice, right? Um, so I guess it, that was sort of making me think about whether, whether Part of Spinoza's assessment of different kinds of state, thinking about it the way you were presenting it, has to do with thinking about um, ambition and how ambition functions in different kinds of state and how ambition should be controlled in different kinds of state. What do we do with the fact that um, everyone wants to give their advice and everyone wants everyone else to live according to their advice, but in fact, in states, we only want certain kinds of advice. We only, we only actually, I mean, in different states, that's gonna, that's gonna differ. So I, I don't think, so I haven't thought of this specifically in the, in the context of the definition of ambition, but thank you very much. I'm, I have to, 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 to look at it more, more clearly, but the, the expression that he uses in the TTP to, to say denounce something similar is that you try to impose uh, others to live by the authority of your own decision, uh, something like that. Uh, 
And some of the bits that I, that I and, 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 and I think actually the longest chapter that I have in, the, in, that, in that book is about forms of unfree philosophizing. Uh, not free philosophy, but philosophizing which take the freedom away from those who speak or those who are spoken to, uh, which is governed by forms of ambition. So those are all the things that, that Spinoza wants to exclude from this public sphere of free philosophizing, which includes uh, uh, not just hatred and coercion, uh, but also, say, softer forms of manipulation, such as what he calls, there's two main forms, uh, which, which are sort of the, the, the standard main forms of, 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 of manipulation of an advisory structure, but it is uh, a flattery. On the one hand, it is what he calls deception with evil intent, those two, uh, which both are, are ways of manipulating uh, people into live according, and especially sovereigns, but also people, into live according uh, uh, to your own decision and according then probably to your own ambition, but I have to look more into to, to that. Um, and what Spinoza has here is that one of the, one of the things that you have with, 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 with the sphere of free philosophizing, I said it's a strikingly optimistic vision and, uh, in itself. If the conditions for uh, free philosophizing being there, uh, it will develop by itself and rationales will come about. And that's all too rosy, isn't it? Uh, and, and it is because uh, uh, eradicating these softer forms, once you have removed the fear of being actually persecuted by violence, which is something you can do by law. You have these softer ways of exercising your authority to teach and advise uh, within the framework of a sphere of free philosophizing, which are not actually natural. This is a free. Of, this is a space of natural right, and deception is not uh, 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 is granted by natural right. You can deceive as much as you want by natural right. So, how do you eradicate? I mean, the, the, the sphere of free philosophizing is extremely vulnerable to forms of deception. So how do you get rid of that? Because you can't do it with legislation. If you do, if you say, you are not allowed to deceive, uh, uh, what you end up with is that you end up hitting the wrong people. You end up curbing the free philosophizing of the best citizens rather than hitting hard on the weak, on the weak-minded and the flatterers. Uh, so, so what he recommends here, he has, a, he has a plan for that, as Elizabeth Warren would say it. Huh? He has a plan for that, and that plan is the one we've been talking about all of the time. It's civic education. You have to indoctrinate people with a sense of responsibility towards their fellow citizens and towards... Uh, 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 towards the, uh, uh, the public good as a whole, and you have to indoctrinate them then from their very infancy because that is the way you can try, you can manage on the long term to curb forms of evil deception and flattery and for, say, personal ambition to be what governs the way that things function in the public sphere. Now, we can all say that might not be a very realistic way of, of putting I don't know whether it's realistic or not, but I think that is what he recommends. Uh, so, yeah. I'm not sure if we have a, just a semantic disagreement, so mm. I'm looking for clarity, because I know you're reading a particular text, and you're reading particular chapters <coughs> in that text, and mm. um, so, yeah, I, I, it, this is clarification. My understanding is that, um, Spinoza believes that we have um, an inalienable natural right to think um, and philosophizing, and thought is a very broad category for, for him, I think. I mean, I think it could, in, you know, it includes um, imaginings and things like, you know, things like that. Whereas um, I'm sure we agree, um, uh, philosophizing is a very particular way of thinking. You know, it's a, it's a subset of thought that's a very particular um, uh, way of thinking. So, I've, yeah, I, I sort of want to, um, I, I want to uh, draw you more mm. on, um, because you, I mean, I, 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 I sort of think we're in agreement, but I'm not sure, because, you know, you make the distinction between civil rights that can be guaranteed and da-da-da, and then the natural rights that you can't. So there's no point in forbidding, uh, for example, you know, I command you to be a Catholic and stop being a Jew. Well, if I'm, gonna, if I'm threatening to burn you, you're probably going to say, yes, you know what, you know, I'm converting now. But then you remove the threat and, and then, you know, the belief. So it's, you know, it's pretending. 
So um, I take it that it doesn't, it almost, you know, he thinks that even with th threats of horrible things, you still can't stop people from thinking whatever it is that they think. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that, to me, is a much broader category than uh, thinking philosophically. Okay, so, so, so two things about that. Uh, so, so what I tried to say is that one thing there is this very broad that you can't prevent people from exercising whatever power that they have. Um, yeah. But I, I, I think uh, we have to, t that's why I make it into this collective thing, is that there's two powers involved, two natural powers involved here, which is on the one hand the freedom of judgment and of thinking, but it's also a freedom of actually saying what you think. You can't prevent yourself from doing it. Unless the only way you can prevent something for saying what they think, I mean, there's, let's say, there's no legalistic, that you cannot prevent anything, anyone by law from speaking their mind. Of course, you can prevent them from speaking their mind. You can kill them, and you can persecute them. You can do it by violence, but you can't do it by law. So that's, that's the, that, that's, that was the first point. Uh, that it's not just a broad category of thinking, it's also a broad category of saying what you think, which is part of this natural authority. The other part of it is about the term philosophizing, and that's, it's true, that is really is a, is a terminological thing. Uh, philosophizing, the way that Spinoza uses the word philosophizing, and the way he uses philosophy are not aligned. If you look around, so I tried to go through all the occurrences of what he, the way that he associated, the, the, the terms, uh, they, they say that there's a whole group of, so you would say, a lexical field of terms that he will associate with activity of philosophizing, and that is not associated with uh, adequate reasoning. It is associated with terms such as the natural light to common to everybody, uh, the, uh, a sound mind, a the recta ratio, the recteratio vivendi, a whole bunch of, 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 of much, much broader terms around the, this common light, nat natural light common to all, about, uh, which is mostly about simple precepts of living, huh? rules of living, which is not about you know, philosophizing in the strict philosophical sense. So, so I think his freedom of philosophizing is concerned with that. It's concerned, it's concerned with rules of living, not with philosophy in the strict natural philosophy sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Morgan. I, I thoroughly enjoy that. But I, the, before I ask you a, a question, I'd like to follow up on the disagreement between Beth and Baruch um, at the risk of generalizing, because I think, you know, it is a problem, big problem, like Baruch is, 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 is saying that, you know, it's not the best citizens that have uh, access to uh, to um, the political, uh, our political representatives and decision makers. Very often, you know, through the lobbyists, they are really, you know, they are the worst citizens. Um, and even though, even though uh, governments fund universities, and not only do they do they let us um, and, and, and fund Spinozian research, they also encourage us, not just encourage us, but they expect us to be excellent, not just in research and teaching, but also in public impact. Um, so in a way, they, they, they make us at least believe that they take us seriously. But at the end of the day, I think you know, there's a big risk that that, that stress and impact, it's just, you know, it's, it's, they want us <laughs> to perform impact, but they, they don't want to listen to what we what we have to say when we exercise that uh, that uh, that that uh, norm of of impact. So I guess um, in this uh, terribly asymmetrical well, well, in our democracy where power power structures are so asymmetrical, how or who can enact their best citizenship? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> caught me there. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really don't. Uh, uh, uh. We so I guess, yeah. I mean, yeah. Th I mean that. Yeah, of course we are. You know, uh, but that is too easy. Um, I don't know. 
believe in what it means to be a citizen is really shifting, isn't it? Yeah. Even what it means to be a citizen is really shifting and you can now buy citizenship yeah. and people do buy citizenship and that's, I don't know, is that new? It seems to me it's kind yeah. of, it's probably not new in history yeah. but I think it's a recent, you know, development in terms yeah. of... I think there are a bunch of developments that I'm, I'm not quite sure that Spinoza has the tools to actually oh, really no, no, deal no, with that. Uh, no, I, I know. I, um, and, and since we're moving into a the kind of synthetic uh, thing, a uh, uh, synthetic realm, yeah. I, I just want to bring up one other idea that, you know, from the, in the sense of best citizens, we have the scientific community, which has a general consensus about climate change that, uh, you know, that is, it's, it's endangering the, you know, our striving to, to be close to God <laughs> in as much time as we have to do that. Um, and, uh, and there's a, th these are all, excellent citizens, I would imagine, uh, global citizens, but they're not listened to. There's no uh, administrative authority to execute a policy based on that very good advice from these best uh, uh, scientific citizens. Yeah. So, so, so can I just say a little word about that one mm. in particular? Because that's sure. something that I've been interested in, 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 in the way that that's uh, because I'm interested in, 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 in common notions, in common notions in, in, in natural philosophy and how they've been used also as a sort of a, a conception of scientific consensus. And, and what we can see today is that the notion of scientific consensus is being used in a particular way as a, as a tool in the public sphere uh, to uh, press a certain, uh, to press uh, 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 the scientific uh, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the scientific truth of climate change. Now, so you can you see it all the time. Every time there's a big climate debate, uh, there's a big climate summit, you will have a, last time, what was it, like 12,000 scientists who all signed up uh, to that this is, you know, we are doing it, and it's every time. Huh? that this idea of consensus, that you have a common notion among scientists that this is really happening, and then they put it in the newspaper and everybody else is supposed to be very impressed with this. And we are very impressed with these. Of course, from a logical point of view, consensus arguments are terrible. Huh? It's the worst, everybody agrees about it, so it must be true. Huh? It's a terrible argument in many ways, because what also happens then is that you have all these counter consensuses that shows up on all kinds of websites. Huh? And you get all these false equivalences. They find, you know, 15 scientists, uh, sort of wacky scientists who agree upon the fact that their scientific uh, climate change is not happening. So that, that is also, and the thing is, uh, um, because there's no real logical foundation for consensus arguments, we have a, a, they're very difficult to handle in the public sphere. It's a very interesting problem. I don't know how to solve it, but it has something to do with when you get uh, the questions like, like Tokyo, so, so who are the best citizens and who should we look to and something can be very, very difficult to navigate because these consensus structures no longer function in the way that they should. Whereas common notions is actually what we're supposed to put our faith in, huh? according to Spinoza. Huh? Yeah. Um, I, I found it compelling that you I think that was really, I found that to be extremely compelling. Um, but I do have some discomfort with uh, the, the way that you structure the idea that there's a, there's a counseling or advising function and then there's this <coughs> deputy function that mm -hmm. you refer to. And I, first of all, I ask myself, what motivates the, the authority or the state to actually come to actually consult the general counselors, the advisors that are out there. That's this is generalized thing. Mm -hmm. So what motivates them to actually want to consult? And then from the, the point of view of the deputy sort of function that these people also have, what stops them from using the deputy function vis-a-vis -vis other um, people like them rather than the state uh, or the sovereign or whatever we're calling it? Um, and then, if we're going to be advisors and teachers, and we have that as a natural right, you, you point out that it has to be somehow indoctrinated, but isn't the indoctrination usually done by the sovereign? So the, the ideas that are indoctrinated generally come from the sovereign's ideas of what should be indoctrinated. 
and then why should we indoctrinate with those particular ideas? So, uh, so, so, so maybe I should make a clarification because this indoctrination word is so loaded, you know. So, 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 so by indoctrinating, you simply mean teaching doctrines and teaching doctrines in a particular sense. Doctrines have a particular status in Spinoza's arguments. Doctrines uh, are, we talked about them yesterday, uh, I think at some point, there are two kinds of doctrines in Spinoza's TCP. Uh, there are doctrines of faith, and there are, is the doctrine of the social contract. Yeah. Those are the two kinds of doctrines. And those are the doctrines that have to be indoctrinated. And it doesn't come, the thing is that this t indoctrination should not come from the sovereign power, something that is forced upon you. It has to be taught. That it means it has to be taught uh, via the kind of authority that is available for teaching, which is the authority to teach and advise, which is a very, very horizontal kind of structure. So that's why we talked about community colleges yesterday, that the kind of thing he would like to have a community college with professors and students being on the same level and this kind of very idealized collegialist conception of, 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 of higher education that he inherits from, from Plokhoi and from, from, from Van den Enden. So that's, the, that's the, the point about indoctrination. No, it's not about you know, indoctrinating from above. It's about teaching doctrines horizontally, actually. So don't take it too seriously, this word about indoctrination, uh, uh, or in that sort of sense. So about the other questions, um, uh, now I have to think. Uh, can you just remind me again what was the first? Yeah, so I was wondering about the deputy, um, like the Oh, well, so yeah. Motivation. Yeah, so, 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 so I mean, there's practical considerations here, which is the same thing. It's just standard practical considerations that we find also in Hobbes, but also whether. It, it's the idea you can't rule alone. It's, it's simply practically impossible. You need a state apparatus in order to govern. So, and it means you need, you need civil servants. Huh? And a deputy is basically a civil servant. I mean, that's the, the same, as Grotius uses the same word in his text. Uh, it's a basically a civil servant who helps the, the, the sovereign to execute his sovereign power. And in that capacity, uh, Spinoza expects that, uh, everyone to simply obey. Now, that means that he says it will, everything will fall apart. This is standard fare. You will also find in Hobbes and Grotius, same thing. Uh, uh, if deputies go rogue and start to follow their own interests or try to impose things by the authority of their own decision. It says that is breach of uh, the indivisibility of sovereignty and that makes the state fall apart. Uh, so, so, so the deputy function has to be, exec it's an executive uh, uh, function where you are there to execute simply whatever decrees the sovereign power emits. And then there's the other capacity where you're in an advisory structure, where you are exercising not a sovereign, let's say, a sovereign authority or public authority or authority of giving laws and coercing people and stuff like that on behalf of a sovereign power, but where you advise a sovereign power. You're not under the, you're not obeying the sovereign, but the sovereign is listening to you, okay? So, and, and that's the advisory. And all I wanted to say is that those two functions must never be mixed up, which is you have the same thing in, in Grotius. He also has the same, these two functions must never be mixed up. Uh, uh, someone like Hobbes has the same problem, but he solves it by simply eliminating the advisory structure, really. I mean, he says, well, do you, if you don't, if sovereign doesn't like the advice, he'll just get rid of the advisor, you know, who cares? Uh, um, so this authoritarian uh, kind of solution to this. Spinoza wants to keep these two spheres separate. Huh? about being a deputy and working on, 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 on executing the, 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 the sovereign power's commands, and then on the other hand, being this council where you have an independent council, and just a question of where is that situated and how do you navigate it if you want to avoid this idea that you have privy councillors, which they were all these republicans in the mid-1650s uh, mid uh, were, 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 were really worried about, uh, um, uh, were these, 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 this idea of having privy councillors just uh, because they thought it would all just be priests and flatterers around them. Huh? Uh, so, so you wanted to open up this advisory structure to the greater public. So that's, that's basically the idea. But I think what, what I heard in your question was something about what do you do when, 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 if deputies go rogue or something like that, and they start, well, you chop their head off. That's what you do. Huh? Okay. So, uh, so, so, I mean, that's basic. That is the solution here. The, or you put them in prison. You, you punish them because they are doing something that they are legally not permitted to do.
Yeah, so th thanks. So that this was really, really interesting. And I have a kind of comment in which you may react at some point that is triggered by your use of TTP 11, the chapter 11, to understand the freedom of philosophizing, which I think is an extremely clever move and indeed makes a lot of sense. But also in the discussion here, it seems that you want, in a sense, to extrapolate the model of freedom of philosophizing from the role model provided by the apostles and applying that to the public sphere made of just normal citizens, right? So just normal people. And then at some point you mentioned in your talk, and then was a bit in passing, that actually that doesn't quite work to core because you need also to have proper citizens. It's not just giving to everybody just the right of saying whatever they want, but of course they need to have the right kind of mind in order to, uh, to have access to that natural light. So that natural light can be clouded in many people, and therefore it seems that it requires to have proper, robust freedom in the stronger philosophical sense in order to exercise that freedom of philosophizing that should be available to everybody. So there seems to be a kind of circularity in the sense that the freedom of philosophizing in the weaker sense requires a proper freedom of philosophizing in the stronger sense that in turn, uh, I mean, you can develop only in a society that has the freedom of philosophizing in the weaker sense. So, and I think what's interesting here is not how you solve this problem, but why this problem arises. And I think it might arise because what you're doing, or what Spinoza is doing, is actually secularizing a concept. Because the, the model he's using is a theological model anyway. It's talking about apostles, disciples of Jesus Christ. Right? Okay, they're, they're arguing, they're using reason, fine. But behind them, there is still a kind of theological authority. And of course, they are also teachers, but they can also be prophets. Right? So, for them, it's not a problem because they do have this kind of theological backup. Now, when you secularize that concept, of course, the theological backup goes away. And the problem arises because what does replace this theological backup, if anything at all? Right? So I think it's interesting as an exercise also in understanding how ideas move from different domains because, of course, you can secularize a concept, detach that from the theological background, and use it for the public sphere, but then the cost of this intellectual operation is that you risk to twist the concept in a way that the concept was not designed for, mm -hmm. right? And that opens up a whole array of new problems that probably leads also to the evolution of the concept in, into something different. And in a sense, I think what we're doing here is exactly the same kind of exercise. We're kind of re-secularizing or secularizing its double degree Spinoza to discuss yeah, global warming. Spinoza wouldn't e probably even understand what this is supposed to be, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm just kind of speculating a bit about that, but maybe you have a comment. Yeah, so yeah, uh, that's, that's an extremely good, uh, good point. I think so, 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 the, the, um, so if you look at the chapter 11, of course, of course that what, what, are the, what are the epistles about? Huh? It is not so much about whether, if, of course it's not about whether the Christian religion is true or not. It is about how do you, they're mostly about how do you interpret the Gospels, which are in themselves already an authoritative truth. So it's basically about, you already have a basic theological truth, which you then discuss with others on how they should interpret these in the right way. So what in a seg more sort of secularized model replaces this theological backdrop of having, which is basically what replaces scripture here? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think we come back to the same things that we've been talking about again and again, the doctrines that people are indoctrinated with from the beginning. Huh? That you start out with this common set of doctrines which are not put into question, uh, um, uh, which is about you have a, uh, uh, there is a, let's say, um, uh, a civic duty towards your fellow man and to, what, and, and to work in, in for the public good, which is based in basic uh, narratives about the uh, 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 about a, 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 a having everybody having committed to the social order so a social contract theory a belief in that and uh, some doctrines of faith which believes which which settles that you must that, that you must be charitable to others even though you're not in position you're not in a position to rationally be able to deduce that yet so those are the ba that's that's the 
basic, so it's actually the same backdrop. I mean, Spinoza does the secularization all by himself, doesn't it? Because that isn't much of a, I mean, because that is what he reduces scripture to in the end of the day. Huh? So there is this doctrinal backdrop uh, 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 that, so from there on, when you enter into the public sphere, what you do is not to discuss whether those values are right or not, but what are the parameters within which they can be interpreted. Huh? So what falls within uh, our civic duty and what does not fall within our civic duty, but given that we have that civic duty because that we have been indoctrinated with. Uh, so I think it would be something like that. Um, yeah. Was that a sort of a reply? Yeah. Mm. Oh, you can. Oh, yeah, I'm taking this. Already in the morning, you addressed the question about the continuity between the uh, two treatises, TTP and TP. And, and in a way, also, you opened your talk then with this question and saying that the Mercato Sapiens or the, the, the enlightened merchant class that is in a way and in that secularized form is the political proposal of Spinoza. And I see at least two points of rupture within the political treaties which maybe motivates us to think that Spinoza at the end of his intellectual life is not the think of benign leadership or of a enlightened upper class, but that he, and also not of the regulative idea of disagree and obey. And, I, and the two points which I see within the political treaties, one is the idea of the potentia multitudinous. Why at all invent it if, we, if, we, if the political proposal would in a way uh, defend um, this form of secularized fraternal advice and its governmental functionality. And the other is the idea that in a, in a limit situation, a political limit situation, when the sovereign is not um, functioning as a kind of fostering the security of the people, then the right falls back to the multitude, which means to just, uh, what is this, suspend the sovereign, just kill, uh, not necessary, could also uh, um, kick him out and other, but it could also be at the end in, in the uh, political treaties, it could also be to, to kill him. But I think that is not the bottom line, not at all. Uh, but it would, but it, uh, uh, it's a right for resistance, disobedience up to revolution without idealizing it. It's, it's for sure a super turbulent and dangerous moment, what can happen from then. But there are those two uh, points of rupture with, with the TTP. Why did Spinoza come up with this? If he would have had as, as punchline in mind what you now uh, Presented to be uh, in the foreground of uh, the first treatise. Yeah. So, so that, that's that's a, that's a, that's a, that, that's another really excellent question. I think um, <coughs> I think he, he comes up with this this notion of the power of the multitude as a it is the regulative idea, to say it's a regulative idea almost within a political structure which is supposed to indicate the fact that if a sovereign uh, 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 um, uh, uh, imposes a violent rule, he will run towards his own destruction. Huh? However, it is not an invitation to be a revolutionary. And I think that's a very important. What he said what, for, for Spinoza uh, is, the, is that he does not think that the power of the multitude will rise up against a, an oppressive tyrant. No, what will happen is that gradually an oppressive tyrant will 
lose so much of his own power through his oppressive rule that the power of the multitude will gain the upper hand at some point and he will just simply disappear or the regime will fall apart. Something like that, but it's not about uprising. What he has, uh, uh, um, it's a question, that the, this power of the multitude is the notion that he uses to establish and maintain against Hobbes and uh, uh, as he says, that, uh, uh, that uh, power relations are still constitutive within a constitutive society, even when a sovereign is, is put there. So there's still a power relation that governs things. So, but, uh, so, so that's what, what, what that notion is there for. But uh, in the context of Spinoza, I think it's very important to always remember that the notion of, let's say, the notion of revolution, which in that time would take the form of different theories of, of uh, regicide, <coughs> Uh, it's associated with what in Spinoza's context? Well, it's associated with, uh, uh, with uh, books like um, uh, uh, Philippe Duplessis Mornay's Vendicia contra Tyrannos. Huh? The idea, basic Calvinist theory about, uh, about, a, 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 about whether uh, a, at some point uh, in, in, on, on religious grounds one may kill a sovereign. Huh? And Spinoza is, of course, fiercely opposed to that sort of thing. So the idea of having revolutions or regicides is something that he's fiercely opposed to. Huh? Sovereignty, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a thinker of indivisible sovereignty here. And sovereignty cannot be violated. It can fall apart by its own, by its own doing. And it will, a violent rule will fall apart by, on, on, by its own doing. We'll do it all on its own, but we should not precipitate it. What we can do, what we can do is you can resist it. Huh? And this resistance happens on, on this sort of uh, upper level of public discourse, which you, can, which you will always have. Uh, this level of public discourse, I mean, a, a sovereign can, of course, try violently to suppress it. But still, it's a, natu it's a natural authority that we have, and he cannot suppress it by law. He can only suppress it by violence. So you always have that right, no matter, how, no matter what kind of violence is going on around, what kind of legal regime is around you, because it's a natural and inviolable, in, inalienable right that you have. So, and that's where you should exercise it, and nowhere else. You should not try to overrule him, or as a deputy, for example, start to you know, go rogue within the administration here. So. On that note, I think uh, we will... Uh, draw this session to uh, conclusion. I mean, uh, I think uh, we have shown that we are in a very turbulent state and uh, we uh, still need uh, uh, many common notions uh, to uh, maybe uh, consolidate some alternative, uh, of course, heterogeneous power uh, 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 distribution to uh, make sovereign power, uh, uh, yeah, to distribute sovereign power among us all. Um, luckily, we're here in a protected in a space that's still like also protected by sovereign power. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, because we haven't done away with that necessity. Now, uh, so I hope you have all uh, enjoyed uh, this as a uh, common notion of a common experience which we uh, have shared together, and uh, that's one of the things that I want to ask you when we go to the other room with a last synthetic uh, question. Uh, but in the meantime. Please uh, uh, give a warm hand to uh, Dr. Moins Lerke and to our very uh, uh, assiduous, earnest, and candid uh, uh, participants who all listened very carefully and patiently and responded uh, very earnestly and uh, carefully. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we will, uh, there is, there will be some pizza at seven if you stick around uh, uh, for everybody. In fact, there's a, a general affordance. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to try to uh, uh, have a, a one question there, so I don't know if that's going to be possible, but uh, we'll, we'll do but our But before best. that, yes, Andrea. Uh, yes. we would all like to thank you for organizing this wonderful conference, okay. which has been very rare for many of us, because yeah. that's not the usual conference setting, and has been very enjoyable. So thank you very much. Baruch and Maria Jose as well. Maria Jose. As usual, I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thank you all for answering my <laughs> invitation and for uh, participating and, and the call. So, uh, thanking uh, is a common thank notion. No, and no, thanks and, and to the thank, audience. Uh, thank all the, uh, the yeah. best team, Maria Jose Sondaiker, and uh, the wonderful uh, team here, which is supporting yeah. us. Yeah?